What is up, everybody? Welcome to Brews and Board Games. My name's Andrew, and today I'm going to be taking a look at the smash hit from Chip Theory Games, Too Many Bones. But first, let's check out the brew of the review. This is going to be an IPA from the new Belgian brewing company, Mr. Bones himself, the Voodoo Ranger. This is their experimental IPA, and I thought it went well with this game, because not only is this dude made up of only bones, but in the game you can experiment with different tech paths, so I thought it went really well. I'm even drinking it out of my steampunk skull looking mug, which funny enough also goes well with this game. So what is Too Many Bones? In this game, you are going to take on the role of a small elf rat looking creature known as a Gearlock. And the Gearlock Council of Elders has chosen you to venture out into the world of Daylor and save it from the growing threat of the Ebon. Lawless creatures ruled by tyrants. This game plays one to four players and takes anywhere from about an hour to three hours, depending on player count, as well as the tyrant that you choose to face. Now, the basic structure of this game is that your adventure is going to take place over a few days. Each day, you are going to draw an encounter card, which is going to have some story, as well as some choices you will have to make. The choices could be non-combat, or be a combat scenario that you will have to set up on the board. The different choices, as well as completing the encounter in general, will have rewards such as loot, which can help you in or out of battle, trove loot, which are very powerful items locked away and can only be attained by performing a special lock picking process, training points that you will use to upgrade your gear lock, and progress points that will advance you closer to facing the tyrant. After accumulating enough progress points needed, you can then challenge the tyrant and face them in battle. Kill the tyrant, win the game. Now the core game is going to come with seven unique tyrants to choose from. Each tyrant is going to designate which baddie types you will be fighting in the campaign, as well as have its own tyrant encounter card, which will be added to the regular encounters spicing up the encounter deck a little bit more. In addition to having their own set of skills, the tyrants will also have their own tyrant die, which is capable of doing some wicked stuff. Now the regular baddies are no slouch either. In addition to their regular attack and or defense roles, they also have skills that can do some pretty nasty stuff that can make your life hell. Taking a look at this Orc Rager for an example, we can see he has Raiding and Rage 2. Raiding means he can roll an additional attack die for every other Orc on the field. And Rage 2 means he can roll two additional attack dice if he is not at full health. So you can see how quickly this guy can get out of hand if he's not at full HP and if there are more Orcs on the field. We can also see this Griffin Yearling has Flight which basically means after it attacks, it will fly into the air and become untargetable. Only after its next turn will you be able to attack this creature again. Now baddies are broken down into three different point groups. This point value is also used to build the baddie points for battle encounters. This works by simply multiplying the day you are on by the number of players. For example, if it is day four and we're playing with two players, the baddie point is eight. And we would draw from these stacks to equal eight. Starting with the highest value we can, so a five point and three one points. Now, to stop this onslaught and save the world of Daylor, we turn to our gear locks with their glorious tech trees and dice of destruction. The core game comes with four gear locks, each with its own neoprene mat, 21 gorgeous dice, and a player aid with so much symbology, it will make you question your decision to buy this game. First up is Patches, who is the healer of the group. Patches likes to run around with med packs, syringes, and chemical concoctions that can either help the team or hurt the enemy. 
as well as being able to revive a KO teammate in battle, which is amazing. Next, we have Pickett, who is your classic tank. This guy has shields on top of shields. Do you even block, bro? Run this guy right in there and do a shield bash dealing damage based on how much shields you have. He can even force some of the baddies to attack him, taking some of the pressure off of your team. Then on to Boomer, who is your ranged pyro chick. Boomer loves chucking out grenades, flashbangs, and lighting the place on fire with napalm. But watch out, she can get a little carried away and might accidentally hurt her own team, but is capable of doing some serious damage. And finally, Tantrum, the young Gearlock who snuck out of the house when his parents told him to go to bed. Now he takes his rage out on the baddies by running straight into the fray and can actually one-shot them, even 20-point baddies. But controlling that rage is key so that it doesn't get out of hand. Now to put all of our amazing capabilities to use, we will turn to the main board where we will perform the dance of combat. The board contains 16 spaces, which creates quite a compact arena, which at times feels more like you're Jason Bourne doing hand-to-hand -hand combat in a small bathroom. Only four baddies can be on the board at a time and are placed first come first serve in the baddie positions at the top of the board. Looking at the first baddie, we can see this orc rager is melee, has five health, and has an initiative value of three. With all baddies placed, gear locks will go on the bottom two rows depending if they are melee or ranged. Gearlocks also roll initiative dice, which will join the baddies dice on the initiative track. Starting with the highest value, units will activate on their turn, moving, attacking, and using their skills. And in the case of gear locks, rolling their skill dice, using loot cards, and rolling too many bones. So they can activate their backup plan, which is essentially compensation for rolling misses. Play is going to go this way round after round until either the gear locks or the baddies are left standing. And after completing multiple encounters, you will accumulate enough progress points to eventually challenge the tyrant. Kill the tyrant and you win the game, but fail to do so in the amount of days specified and you lose. And there you guys go, a semi-quick overview to hopefully give you some sort of idea of what this game is about. Now first, let's start off with some positives and things that I like, followed by some critiques, and then I will wrap it up with some final thoughts. So first up, why don't we just talk the components, everything that you see before you. All of this stuff does come in the core game, and let me just read you off some stats. All of this stuff comes in the core game. 139 dice, 129 cards, 71 poker weighted chips, 65 lightweight chips, five neoprene play mats, and four dice trays. And let me just tell you, all of these components are top quality. This is what Chip Theory Games is known for. I also have Hoplomachus from them and Cloudspire, and it's the same deal. I feel like they just put an extra amount of love into the components that they put into the game. Uh, the cards are fantastic. Uh, the artwork on them is kind of like a, um, it's like a black and white sketch uh, feeling. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's like a simplistic design, but it kind of gets you into the theme a little bit. It's cool. Uh, you'll find that on the, the Lou cards, uh, the Trove Lou cards, and the monster or the tyrant dies, or tyrant cards, excuse me. Uh, it's that same kind of artwork feel. Even the encounter cards have this like worn out parchment paper type deal. It's kind of like you know, it kind of almost feels like you're going on an adventure reading this worn out scroll. It's cool. The chips themselves, these are like your standard weighted poker chips. Uh, it comes with the same satisfying clack when you move them around. And they're nice too. The artwork on the baddies is kind of the same as that black and white sketch that I was just talking about for the cards. 
and they're nice. And I believe that this artwork on there, on the front and the back, I believe that they are just stickers that they put on there. Uh, but one thing that I will mention, I've probably had this game for around two years now. And in all of that time, I've gotten expansions for Too Many Bones. Um, I've gotten games, you know, like I just mentioned, Clouds Fire and Hoppamakis. I've played them all a bunch. I don't play this as much as probably other people, but these chips and dice have seen their fair share of usage. And in all of that time, I've only had one chip, one chip out of all of those with the sticker slightly off. Not even that it was peeling off or anything like that, but just, and I think it was the back here, the point, I, it was off a little bit. But even then, it was still really sticking to the chip itself. Uh, it was never an issue. So they're cool. The lightweight chips that come for the health, these are fine. Uh, I believe that these are hollow. Uh, and they're all this standard red with the Chip Theory Games uh, symbol on them. And they're fine. Some people have complained that they do slide around a little bit more when you're moving them. And they do more than the standard chips. But honestly, it's not bad at all. Uh, it might fall over once or twice here. Um, but I haven't really had an issue with it at all. For what they are, it definitely works. The play mats are really nice. They all have this stitched edging all the way around. They have cool artwork showing your character and they have that same kind of parchment paper to show your stats. And they have this cool little tech tree system where the art's really cool. It has, you know, the arrows are easy to see. All the text is legible. But the coolest thing about the play mats is all of the spots where your dice are supposed to go are actually cut out so you can actually slot your dice inside of the play mat. Super cool. I mean, you can even pick this thing up and the dice don't fall out of it. They're snug, uh, but they're not tight. Like you can still take them and uh, take them out and put them in easily, uh, but they are snug. And that is just a, it's such a cool feeling to just acquire a new die and just be like, oh, it goes right there in that spot. You know, they all have numbers on there and they match up with numbers on the play mat itself. And it's just cool to just be like, there we go. There we go. I just upgraded that, right? I just got poison dart and it goes right there. It's just, it's just super cool. They easily could have just uh, made this one solid play mat and just said, oh, you know, just, just set the die there on top of the play mat. But they didn't. They went the extra mile. And that is, it's such a nice, uh, it, it's awesome. It is awesome to do. Um, and then on that note, let's just talk about the dice themselves. One of the coolest things in this game are all of these dice. I read it off, 139 dice. Uh, that's gonna be all of your customized Tyrant die. All of them have their own unique symbols and artwork on them. Uh, your initiative dice for the gear locks themselves, they all have the faces on there. That's pretty cool. You have dice to show the initiatives for the baddies. You have your attack dice, your defense dice, your negative status effect dice. You have four unique dice for just for lock picking. Very cool. And how could we forget the dice for the gear locks? I believe each gear lock has something like 21 dice. And most of all of these are unique to one another. Each of the gear locks has like its own color scheme and all of the backgrounds of the dice are that color. But then on top of that, they have the artwork and all of the symbols that are different colors, creating this just smorgasbord of just colors that just look fantastic. Honestly, I love these dice. I love dice games in general, so this just scratches that itch. This is just a feast for the eyes. I challenge somebody to find a game with better looking dice than this. Dice Throne might give it a run for its money. It might be a contender, but honestly, I still give the edge to too many bones. The best looking dice I've seen in any game. There are just so many in this game. It is just fantastic if you love dice. And one thing I did forget to mention about the cards in the game, as well as the reference sheets, all of the cards and reference sheets are made out of like this PVC feeling material. It's sweet. It's not just your regular paper. 
I mean, you don't really have to worry about damaging this stuff as much. And the best part is, if you're playing this with some friends and some people spill something on the board, not to worry. All of this stuff, including all of the reference sheets and cards, are waterproof, which in turn makes them alcohol proof, which I found out the hard way. The core box is rocking some decent organization, which is broken down into a few different pieces, allowing you to easily take this stuff out, allowing for some faster setup. There are four dice trays that come in this core box. You can either store your character dice individually, or you can use these for some future character expansions. Taking this out, we can see the bottom section, and this is where we're gonna store all of our chips, as well as all of the play mats. Now, the cool thing is, in this core game, there is enough space left over that you can actually store additional character play mats. Using this, I was able to store four additional characters as well as the adventure map. In addition to that, I was also able to store the 40 Days in Daylore expansion, which has its own card deck, and I was able to store the additional chips down here. Now, again, I was using this for the longest time, and it definitely works well for what it is. You go any more than this, and you might have to invest in one of the most glorious storage solutions on the planet. All in all, the components in this game are top notch. You are getting your money's worth. Next up, let's talk the encounter cards. This is a huge thing in this game. As I mentioned in the overview, as the day counter ticks up, you are gonna draw a new encounter card. On the front here, you are just gonna have some flavor text. It's gonna create a scene, a scenario for you. And then on the back, you are gonna have some choices. This could be one choice. This could be up to like three I've seen before, and they could be non-combat and combat. Now, all of the choices relate to the story that you read on the front. And some of these are pretty cool. In the battle scenario, the usual default is to take the day times the amount of players. Uh, so then you would create the baddie pool, like we used in the example of eight, you would draw a five chip and then three one point chips and then put them out on the board. But what the scenarios can do, the choices on these encounter cards, some of these battles, if you choose a battle, it can drastically change how you either set up the board or special rules for that particular battle for the encounter. For example, we have a few here. We have four here. Uh, this is Mystery in the Mountain. So basically, your group has been traveling for a few days and sees basically a cave carved out into the mountain. There's some guards there and some people want to go into the cave. Some people are kind of a little bit more weary. So you have a few options on here. This, we have three options. One, we could do a combat uh, selection. So we would set up the batty points, the day times the number of players. But then also a special rule is you add a five point batty for every gear lock in your party to the bottom of that queue. If you choose that selection, not only do you get the rewards for completing the encounter at the bottom, but you also get a trove loot, the special loot that you will need to unlock with the lock picking dice. Your second option then is stick to the centuries. It's already quite a battle. So basically the option that you're choosing is saying, hey, we don't wanna go into the mine. We just kinda wanna stay out here and fight these guards. What, so this is also a battle option and you set up the baddie points like normal, but for this one, you add six points to the baddie queue, then add a one point baddie for every gear lock in your party to the bottom of the baddie queue. You also get an additional training point if you choose this option. And the third option, which is a non-combat, says let's scout and return. So basically you're not even gonna to attempt to fight those guards or go into the tunnel. You just wanna stay back and scout. And for that, you reveal two baddies in your active stacks. So you can actually take and look at the baddies in the stacks to see who is gonna come up, making, you know, giving you some scouting information. But then it says, place this encounter back on top of the encounter deck no encounter rewards for this choice. You get nothing if you choose that. The next card we have here says, finally, open skies. So basically you've been traveling under this dense forest for quite some time. You enter this clearing, the sun is shining down on you and your spirits raise a little bit. 
just to hear the sound of war cries. So you have a little text here that says, our first instinct says to run for cover, but that may warrant us an arrow in the back. So looking at the options here, our first one says, we fight here and now. This is a battle. It says, batty points, we set up like normal. But then it says, your party cannot use defensive dice in battle. The whole entire battle for this scenario, you cannot use, roll defensive dice. Crazy. The second option says, to the woods. So this is another battle. You set up the batty points. Your party cannot roll anything other than defense dice for the first two rounds. So you can only roll defensive dice for that. So the encounters can just drastically change like your standard battles, or if you choose a non-combat, crazy things that you can do throughout the campaign. There's 30 encounter cards that come in the game, and I think there's 12 solo encounters. Uh, specifically for only playing one gear lock. And that's cool. And not to mention the special tyrant cards and tyrant encounter cards that come with the specific tyrant that you're facing. You shuffle these into the encounter deck and each of those is unique to the tyrant as well. And what's cool is you're not going to go through this encounter deck each play session with 30 cards and each tyrant only specifying that you are going to be using a certain amount of encounter cards that's going to create each session you know it's going to make it a little bit different each time as well as like i said adding these a unique tyrant encounter card and not only that there are multiple choices on each of those encounters we read off a few they're very fun to do and so with multiple choices if you do encounter that same encounter card again you're gonna be able to choose a different option. Maybe you do wanna go further into the mines, right? Or maybe you don't wanna challenge that, that uh, challenger, but maybe now you do. You can choose different options each time, creating a different story or campaign every time. So the replayability with these encounter cards is really cool and I really like the way it changes up just the default set up the baddie points, set up the gear locks and fight. It really can create these cool things. The loot cards are cool. Uh, some of these things are really gonna help you in battle. You can only have four at a time and some of the cards are labeled as heavy, which they count for three spaces. So you'd only be able to have a heavy loot item and one non-heavy item. But some of these are cool. A lot of them are like healing stuff that you can use in battle or out of battle. Uh, some you can get a consumable die, which is a special die that you can only acquire through using some of these loot cards. Uh, and they're cool. I, I really like all of these. Uh, there's, there are a ton of loot cards. You are not gonna go through these uh, every scenario. The Trove loot cards are cool. And these are cool because they have, you know, it's locked here. So you're gonna need to unlock this before you acquire this loot using these special, these four special lock picking dice. And you're gonna roll these during your recovery phase and they have specific rules too, and you're gonna to have to uh, get different values on these dice, and then you have a special dice, which basically you can perform different actions uh, depending on the face that it rolls. So you're gonna to have to unlock these three locks, and then when you do, you get the Trove Loot Reward, and these can be really powerful. So it's cool, it just adds another element that you can do in the game, like in the recovery phase, you can do some lock picking. That's just awesome. They could have easily have made these like all regular loot cards, but just the fact that they created some more powerful loot and just said, you know what? You need to do a fun little thing of unlocking. I just think that's neat. And these are cool to use. Uh, sometimes it doesn't always work out. And these are very difficult to figure out when you just get the game. Uh, Chip Theory Games does have a video on YouTube. So I suggest you check that out to learn more about the lock picking dice, but it is fun. It adds a nice little touch. Next up, let's talk just the battles in general. I was joking around in the overview saying it's kind of like a Jason Bourne scene, you know, when he's in like a confined space just doing hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy. That's kind of what this feels like to me. It's a four by four grid board. And I mean, if this is filled with baddies and gear locks, there is not a lot of movement. It's like a tight, confined space. 
Sometimes there's just going to be baddies right in front of you. You're going to be cornered and pinned and you just might not be able to move. But I like it. The flow can be pretty fast once you start getting everything down. So we would just say, okay, it's round one. The yellow baddie is going first. It says he has one uh, attack die that he's going to roll. He has thick skin one and careless. So he's right in front of Tantrum. He's just going to roll a die. He got one hit. Tantrum does not have any defense. So Tantrum loses a health. It is the green baddie's turn. So right here we have the Griffin Yearling. He's right in front of uh, Picket. He's going to roll two attack dice. Roll them. He got a bone, which is going to do nothing. And he got one attack. So Picket has a shield. He's going to get rid of that shield. And now the Griffin Yearling has flight. So he is going to go up into the air. We set a uh, status effect die on him, indicating that he is currently flying. And he cannot be attacked right now. So then we have Patches who is already in front of this uh, minion or baddie. Do we want to stay here? Do we want to move? Because you have to move first, and we only have four dexterity that we can use. And the dexterity basically says that's our total culmination of how many movement points we can do plus how many dice we can roll as well. So if we only have four, if I do another movement over here, now I can only roll three dice. Uh, if I was going to roll dice. So I am just going to stay here and attack this person, but I'm also going to roll my uh, one of my skill dice. So I can roll what, what combination do I want to do? So I can do two attack dice, one defense, and the poison die. Roll that. I got two hits, a defense, which locks in. I was able to put a poison on him, so we're going to put the negative status effect on him and we do two damage to him. Now he is down to one hit. Uh, next up is Boomer. We're gonna do this, and you're just gonna go through the battle like that for each gear lock and baddie, and that's cool. So then you'll apply all the skill effects from everybody, you'll roll all of your skill dice, um, and that's just it's just a fun thing. It's, it's almost like a puzzle that you're trying to figure out. And then after everybody goes, it goes to round two, starting all over again. Now, this round tracker, once it gets to six, it actually goes into what's called the fatigue rounds. So basically, it's like a timer on the battle. And what happens with the fatigue rounds, all the units on the board, no matter if they're baddie, tyrant, uh, gear lock, doesn't matter you are going to lose one HP simultaneously. So it's it's cool. The battles aren't going to drag out forever. And I overall think that's a good thing because that puts a clock on the battle itself. You don't want one battle where people might just be able to keep healing and you know, you're taking damage or rolling defense. They're just getting through the defense. You're not making any headway on that enemy. They keep healing as well. You don't want a single battle to go on forever. So it's cool that the fatigue round kind of sets a timer on it. So I just like that aspect. And I just like the flow of the battle in general. I think once you start getting the iconography and you start memorizing some of the skills, I think the battles can flow a lot faster and it's cool. I just think it's a lot of fun. It's cool trying to solve like this puzzle where you only have a certain amount of spaces to go and you have to choose which skills that you're gonna roll against the monster which defense dice, which attack dice. It's, it's very cool trying to figure that out every single time and working with the other people if you are playing with them, trying to see, okay, what's the best uh, form of attack as a group, right? You come together, there's a lot of interactions with these battles. I personally love this and this is what keeps me coming back to the game. And honestly, who doesn't love just taking a bunch of dice, rolling it and having an epic turn, wiping out an enemy, or you threw a grenade and you just took out two enemies. It's just cool. You can create some epic moments in this game and just solving this puzzle is just fun. It, to me, it is just a lot of fun. And now that we mentioned some dice rolling, let's talk about one of my favorite things in this game, in addition to the battles. The tech paths that you can take for each gear lock and these beautiful custom dice. Now I mentioned in the overview that all of the gear locks are asymmetric and that's completely true. They all play drastically different than one another. 
they all are going to have these basic four stats of health, attack, defense, and dexterity, but they're also going to have their own unique tech paths that you can explore. These are also going to be broken down by different colors, which represent different categories. In addition to that, if you want to start placing dice in a new category, you first have to start at the star. So say, for example, we're playing patches and we want to acquire the bone saw, which is basically going to allow us to deal a number of damage to the target, depending on the value that we roll. Well, we can see the bone saw is over here. So we first have to get the med kit and the fast hands. So if we want to eventually get the bone saw, when we get a training point, we're going to have to first uh, acquire the med kit die. And then we are going to have to get the fast hands die. So you are going to have to decide which path you want to take. When I was first playing this game, I wanted to get all of the dice. That's, that's what I love. I love this part. I love being able to just be like, okay, what do I want to choose for this enemy? Or do I want to do poison and heal my teammate in the same time? Or do, when playing picket, do I want to swap with the baddie and then do taunt so uh, this baddie is actually attacking me and then I'll be able to perform a shield bash on that. Picking and choosing which skill dice to play on your turn is to me one of the funnest things in this game. Playing these special skills. Yeah, cool, it's, you know, it's fun rolling the attack and doing a certain amount of damage on the attack. But why I truly wanted to get into this game and continue to play this game is for these special dice. And that being said, at first when I started playing the game, I only wanted to get these special skills. So every time I would get a training point, I would spend it on these, you know, these special skill dice. And I was neglecting my main stat dice. But what happened was I was just getting wiped out because you got to get your health up. You got to get your regular attack. You're not going to be able to roll these every single turn. And then you're going to have to get your dexterity up because if that is too low, maybe you can only roll one of these in addition to an attack and a defense every turn. Maybe you can't even do that. So you have to get these stats up as well. And what that creates over the course of a set amount of time, you know, a campaign, if you will, you're only going to get a certain amount of training points. So what that means is you're not going to be able to get every single skill dice. And when I started to realize that at first I was like, oh man, you know, but I want them, right? I, I want all the skill dice. But I found beauty in that as well, because what that created was now for the playthroughs, I could go, OK, I got to get my stats up. Right. What do I want to explore now? So maybe, for example, like I'm playing picket and I'm playing against a certain tyrant. Maybe I want to go for this captain mastery, which has stand ground, shield form and sword advance, allowing me to lock those dice in a special lock slot. And that lasts for the entire adventure, basically granting us for some free regeneration, uh, upgraded attack, maybe upgraded defense, and that lasts the whole game. Or maybe I want to explore some other tech path, which basically says, hey, when you move this amount of, uh, you deal this amount of damage, uh, okay, you roll this dice, it negates any kind of damage or negative effects coming at you, or and you're able to deal damage back to them if they attack you. You can explore different tech paths, and I think that's the way to play the game. Like I mentioned, at first I wanted to get everything, but having to choose which dice you are going to get for this campaign and being able to mix that up every campaign is fun. So not only in the core game do you have four gear locks, you also have multiple tech trees that you can explore every campaign, increasing the replayability. And I just think it is so fun to choose those to uh, venture into the tech pass. Maybe you get a little bit in each tech path, right? But it's cool to acquire these dice, you know, choose the path, get the dice, slot them into their special places, and then roll those to perform these cool effects on the board. I love this. I love the tech tree and I love these special dice. Again, I can't stop talking about these dice. You could have had this kind of battle system and I think the game still would have been fun, but just having these kinds of tech trees on top that you can explore and you can pick and choose how you spend your uh, training points, that makes the game even better.
And one more thing that I wanted to bring up in the positive section. I've been talking a lot about variety, four different gear locks, each with different tech paths that you can take, seven different tyrants that play differently, loot cards, trove loot, and counter cards, which are different from amongst each other, but not only that, have different choices that you can make on them as well. Well, if you like this, you like all this stuff, you want more gear locks, you want more encounter cards, you want more baddies and tyrants, you are in luck. You just want more and Chip Deer Games has made plenty more. You have another standalone expansion, which comes with its own adventure board, more gear locks, two to be exact, and more tyrants. You have 40 days in day lore, which adds more tyrants, more baddies, and more encounter cards. You have another campaign that you can play as well, adding more stuff to Too Many Bones. You have Splice and Dice, which changes the game drastically. You can create your own tyrant and baddies. You then have more gear locks that you can play. You have Gilly. You have Tank. You have Gasket. Can't put Gasket up here. You have Nugget. You have Dart. You even have the Lab Rats. So if you want more Too Many Bones, it is definitely out there. And they even have more stuff upcoming later this year. Not to mention an entire storage solution specifically made for all of this Too Many Bones stuff made by Chip Theory Games, known only as the Trove Chest. This thing takes up an entire cube and it comes stacked with drawers and specific spots for you to place all of your stuff. You gotta take it out of all of these boxes, but it is so worth it. The art on there is gorgeous, and it is just one of the most beautiful storage solutions I have ever seen for a game. So simply put, if you want more of what's in the core game, there's more, there's a lot more. But why that's cool is because now you have a lot more characters, 12 total to be exact. And so if all of these characters play asymmetric and all of the expansion characters do as well, just imagine that. There's characters that can play songs. There's uh, characters that can put out companions, animals that come onto the board, lay traps. There's characters that are actually a steam bot. Gasket here, I, I, Gasket here, he doesn't take any poison damage and he's, he doesn't get scared in battle, but he's gotta use a certain die that's hydro, basically a maintenance die. You have Tink who actually creates bots that come onto the board. You have Nugget who has one of the best dice in the game, the Long Blade. And this thing does an automatic hit and it does not exhaust. You have all of these characters which play drastically different, adding to the replayability, adding to the encounter card deck, creating all of these new encounters, creating more tyrants for you to fight and explore. All in all, it just adds a lot more of the very things that you love out of the core box. The very things that you love playing with. The board and the characters and the tech tree. But all of this awesomeness is also a double-edged sword. Now I know this isn't a critique of the actual gameplay, but sometimes having too much stuff available for a game can be a detriment. Oftentimes I see questions asking about, you know, I want to get into too many bones, but where do I start? Do I start with the core game? If so, do I need any expansions to get the full gameplay experience? If I don't get any expansions, what am I missing out on? What is Undertow? Do I, can I just play the game with Undertow or do I need Undertow with an expansion? Uh, what about Splice and Dice? What do I need in order to play that? There's so many questions surrounding where people can hop into because there's so much stuff available. People might not understand that if they see Age of Tyranny, oh, well, is that a standalone game as well? Or I see these character expansions, what exactly do these do? What all is included in this? I know you can find the information online and on the sites, but sometimes when there is just so much, it can feel like you're gonna be uh, investigating the game for so long, sometimes it just straight up turns people off. Now, my recommendation would be to just get the core game. 
if you wanted to get the core game uh, with an expansion, I'd probably say to get a character pack or to get the 40 days in day lore. That is going to add a lot more encounters, more tyrants, and more baddie chips. Adding the extra character can just flavor up the game even more. But there is enough stuff, enough, we went over all of the core game components just in the overview, and so far everything that I've been talking about is all core game. You can get so much replayability out of just the core game. Now, alternatively, you could also get Undertow, which is a standalone game where it comes with its own battle mat. You get all the pieces that you need to play the game, and it comes with two characters that aren't in the core game. It is cheaper because there is less stuff, but you are playing Too Many Bones. You are getting the Too Many Bones experience playing Undertow. My recommendation wholeheartedly, though, was if you want to try this game, I would start with the core game. Maybe one character. If you don't get the character, get the 40 days in day lore if you must get an expansion. But you could just stick with the core game. So while all of this stuff is awesome, and it is awesome, trust me, there is just so much that some people will just not even take the time to look into it and will just be thrown off by it. Now, let's move on to some gameplay critiques. First up, this game can be brutal. Some of these baddies can do some pretty wicked stuff. We mentioned some of the skills earlier in the overview. But in addition to that, when you roll your initiative die, you don't have a set value like some of these baddies do. So you got to roll a die, and whatever number it comes up as, that's where you go in the initiative track. And it's not unlikely for you to roll bad and then have to go after some or all of the baddies. And if you're going after all of these baddies who are coming right up in your face, doing their attack damage, as well as doing their skills against you, sometimes you can just get one shot and it's over. I've seen it before. It does happen. If you're playing in a group, at least the rest of the group can continue the battle. But if you're playing solo, you're out. So it can be just frustrating sometimes if that happens. You roll bad on the initiative die, oh, I'm probably dead, right? Because uh, not only is this five-point baddie, this Griffin Howler coming in, but he's rolling three attack dice. And you haven't even had a turn yet to roll your defense dice to have any sort of shot protecting this three damage. And guys, there are two values on these attack dice. So he's rolling three attack dice, but not only that, he's also bringing an additional baddie into the baddie queue. So if there's already four on the battlefield, this other baddie's going to wait in the wind. So when, when one spot clears up, he's going to come onto the board. Also, in addition to that, he flies up into the air after he attacks you. So not only did he get a first strike on you pretty much, but now he's flying in the air. And if you move away from him, because you're like, dude, I don't want him to roll three attack dice at me just yet again. Too bad. He also has dive, which basically means wherever you are on the battlefield, if he's targeting you, he goes right next to you and he's rolling three dice against you again. So it's just some of these baddies are just insanely tough. That's a five point baddie. That's a five point baddie. The 20 point baddies is where it starts really getting serious. This 20 point baddie, this golden golem, he has nine health. He's rolling five attack dice and he's rolling three defense dice. He has an initiative value of five. That's pretty high. Not only that, he has what's called break. So if you roll your attack dice against him, let's say you're like, you know what? He's rolled his defense dice, right? He's got nine health. He had three defense before. I was able to clear that. Now is the time, right? Now is the time. I'm going to get in there with Pickett. I'm going to do some damage, right? I'm going to roll three attack dice. Um, and I'm going to roll two defense dice, right? All right, all right, I got some good damage, right? I got four damage, taking him down to five, all right? However, he has break, which basically says 
all the attack dice that you used, they essentially get exhausted. That's a unique thing. Now you're like, hold up, I thought attack dice didn't get exhausted. Break now means that they do if you attacked the golden golem. So whatever your attack stat was, if, it's, if it was three, you can no longer roll regular attack dice. If Pickett were to ever attack this golden golem again, he has to use another means of doing damage besides attack dice. If he had a, an attack stat of four and he only rolled three that time, he still could roll one attack dice. But as soon as he did and it hits, that is now broken as well and he can't use those. But then on the golden golem's turn, he is now rolling his dice again. So he's right up in your face and he's rolling five attack dice and three defense dice. Oh, not only that, on his roll, he got a bones, which says on his chip, he recovers two health. So now not only did he do like six damage, seven damage to you. Oh, you didn't have shields? Tough crap. But he also got defense and he healed too. The game just has some enemies like that that are just absolutely brutal. Some of the enemies are kind of scrubs, right? You got some guys that if they attack and they roll a bones, they actually hurt themselves. But some of the other ones are just, they are vicious, man. So you got to be prepared to really think about some of the moves that you're making. And you got to really plan it out sometime and be prepared to just take an insane amount of hits and be prepared to just have some scenarios where you might not even get to take a turn. So the game can be brutal. And that's not even talking about some of the tyrants who also have their own special skill dice, which can just obliterate people. So the game can be hard. And the last critique I have for the game is the amount of nuanced situations that come up. We were going over some of the skills. And when it comes to the skills and when things happen is where the most question marks start popping up. Uh, there's like, there's a ton. There's lashback, thick skin, careless, dive, signal, flight, raiding, uh, rage two, careless, hardy, and so many more. First, you got to understand what they do. But also you got to understand when exactly they take place. They all don't take place just when the baddie is attacking. So if they take place, what happens? Like, let's say, for example, we have this troll brute right here who basically rolls one attack die and one defense die. But if he rolls a bones, he actually damages himself. So let's pretend he rolls an attack and with the uh, defensive die, he rolls a bones, dealing one damage to him. Let's pretend he's only at one HP. Does that one attack go through? Like, do you apply the bone first so he's dead and he doesn't even get to do the attack? There's so many different things like that. Uh, when you get to the fatigue rounds, everybody on the board takes a damage at the same time. But let's pretend Pickett here only has one health left, but he also has a, a locked die, which says when it comes to his turn, he gets to regenerate one health. Well, what takes effect first? Is it the fatigue, so he would actually die? Or does the regen happen because he's first in the initiative order um, and then the uh, fatigue happens? Some of this stuff is more cut and dry, but you're going to need to go through the FAQ that Chip Theory has on their website. Not only that, you are going to have to go through probably plenty of board game geek posts answering just a slew of questions that honestly has to be the uh, game with the most asked questions. I put money on it, that and probably Cloudspire, another chip theory game. So there are just so many things that pop up. I mean, when it comes to like poison movement, you know, when can you, can you attack and then move, you know, uh, who gets to do what first you have this skill versus this skill. Which one takes effect first? There are literally probably hundreds of situations like that. Uh, and they can come up quite often. Oftentimes you'll just have a game and you'll just need to put on pause because you have to look up a rule. If you don't like house ruling stuff and you want to get it legit, because most people do. So if you want to do that, you're going to have to pause, take a look at the, uh, 
one of the reference sheets that comes in the game, probably not only to find out what that skill does, but when that skill takes effect. Oh, and now you have a special special situation that came up. Okay, let's get on board game geek. Let's pause the game for 10 minutes while I look this up. Uh, and then 10 minutes later or in a next scenario, oh, we got another thing and that comes up. Even to this day, even though I can tell you what a lot of these skills on the baddies do and when they take effect, even to this day, there are still things that come up that I have to look up. Still questions. And that's fine. I don't mind looking those up because I want to I want to figure it out but if you're just starting the game and you're running into all of these things and not, I mean the symbology on all of these reference sheets there's just so much to go through at first anyway not only and we're not even talking about the nuanced situations there's just so many skills that you're going to need to go through and that first play 2 3 10 you are going to be constantly still looking up skills to figure out, okay, all right, all right. And you're going to start to know them, right? You're going to start to figure out, okay, this takes effect then because you're also going to be going through some of the FAQs and board game geek posts, figuring out those answers. So there can be a lot. So as a new player coming in, having all these things with the game being brutal on top of it, sometimes that can just be too much. It, it really can just having all these situations. You're like, you know, I don't want to be looking up stuff every 10 minutes trying to figure out, you know, when this happens. I just want to freaking go here and roll dice and, you know, have this happen and use my skill dice. Okay, well, you can, but also this guy is going to say, okay, all your shit's gone. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like uh, there can just be a lot and that can be that can be hard for new players. So final thoughts. I'm sure you all have been able to piece the puzzle together to determine, yes, I like this game. I wouldn't have bought all that stuff, at even the Trove chest, if I didn't like this game. I did start out with the core box. I played the core box for quite some time. And then what I did, I actually got character expansions. I got the adventure play mat. I was able to store four additional characters and that adventure play mat with the 40 days in day lore expansion in this core box for the longest time. I also highly recommend the 40 days in Daylore. I think it's a fantastic expansion. It just adds more of what you already like from the core box. I like a lot of things about the game, which I went over a lot of. I like the tight, compact battle arena. Um, it's just like you're in there doing fist fights and it's like a little puzzle that you have to figure out. I just love taking my guy, you know, it's got the poker chips, moving them around taking them straight up into somebody's face and just rolling my special skill dice to do something wicked to them. I love that stuff. You know, picking and choosing which skill dice that I'm going to acquire throughout the adventure, picking different tech paths each time. Now I want to explore this option. Now I want to explore this option. I love just doing that. I love picking the tech tree, you know, the path that you're going to choose for this campaign. You can't get all the skill dice. So which paths are you going to take for this particular tyrant or this particular campaign because maybe you didn't pick that skill path last time but you're interested so you want to try that again or you play a different character doing the same thing with them and the dice on top of it are just awesome the most beautiful dice i've seen in any board game like i said and not only that being able to acquire these skill dice spend your hard-earned training points on them and then take them and slot them right into its own little home on your beautiful neoprene stitched play mat. Also, in addition to that, I love the encounters. I, I just think the way that the encounters mix up the game is super cool. The different choices that the game provides all do drastically different things, changing up a standard battle into a unique experience every single time. Not only that, the tyrants themselves are cool. You got the tyrant encounter cards, which you can experience sometimes, and they are just brutal. And it's it's honestly a notch on your belt to take down one of these tyrants. And if you fail fighting the tyrant or a scenario in general, that's okay. The day counter is just gonna tick up and as long as it's before the allotted days that the tyrant gives you, you can continue the campaign. So you can try to fight the tyrant multiple times, but also just know as the day counter ticks up, not only did you not receive those skill points and training points from before, 
but now you're going to have to face more baddies so it gets even tougher and you sometimes might just not even be able to take on the tyrant or kill the tyrant i mean so it presents a challenge that once you get there and once you take out that tyrant you have a sense of accomplishment so not only is this fun I love the battle system. I do. I love moving around the guys. I love the chips. I love rolling dice. If you guys know me by now, I love rolling dice. All of that is fun on top of gaining the loot, on top of trying to pick through this trove loot, on top of the encounter cards and the multitude of baddies that you have able to fight and mixing it up, adding to the replayability, the variety, the asymmetrical stuff of everything. I like it. I like it a lot. I think it's really fun. It creates a lot of table interaction because if you're playing with a group, you got to plan and strategize your turns, right? You don't want to just have them run in. You know, you want to be like, okay, well, Pickett's going to run in there to give Boomer some defense, right? You got to plan this stuff out. Or if you're playing solo, that also presents a unique experience, which is a lot of fun and a lot different than a multiplayer game but still balanced because you also have solo encounters and also your baddie points aren't going to be that high because you do the day times one player. So you're not going to have as many baddies. So I think it scales really well as well. This is one of those games that if I'm like trying to decide which game to play, right, I'm standing in front of the shelves and I'm like, okay, what game haven't I played for a while? Okay. Do I want to, do I want to choose out of a game I haven't played for a while or even if I do, right? I have all of these, these options. You just have some of those games where you're like, you know what, I like it, but I don't want to play it right now. This game most of the time is in a running to be like, you know what, yeah, I did play it, you know, two weeks ago or whatever, but I wouldn't mind getting it out and, uh, you know, trying Gasket or trying Stanza, right? Trying to learn some of these other songs that I haven't before, right? So it's just... This is always in that running every single time I, I sit down and I'm like, okay, let's narrow it down. This always seems to be in there. I really like the game. I, I do. It does have some of its negatives, right? It, it can be brutal. Even sometimes for me, understanding some things and able to plan my moves a little bit better, knowing which dice to roll, maybe knowing a little bit better about what stats to get, especially for certain tyrants you still might have some really bad games. You might roll your initiative die low, right? So you just get all of these enemies pounding you before you're even able to do anything. Your rolls as well, maybe they just come up crap. It is a dice game with all of this randomness. That's a factor. As well as the baddie skills, they can just tear you to shreds sometimes. And then when you finally get to the tyrant, you've gathered up all these training points, you feel like you're ready, you go in there, and maybe their tyrant die just says, not today, buddy, not today. On top of all of the stuff that you have available, which is that double-edged sword, like I was mentioning, it's so cool, right? It just adds more of the same stuff. But at the same time, it's expensive, and there is a lot, and you might not know where to hop in if you're just starting out. That can put people off, man. It really can. As well as the nuanced situations that can come up quite often if you haven't experienced them before. You're going to be spending a lot of time looking up stuff, getting the FAQ, reading over some of the reference sheets on top of already having uh, iconography overload from just looking at the reference sheets them themselves. Just learning your character can be a lot on top of all of the baddie skills and the special, you know, the encounters, setting it up differently than you're used to. So it can put some people off, not knowing where to start and all of these, this brutal stuff and the nuanced situations. But overall, I highly recommend this game. There's a reason why it's rated highly from so many people. I just feel Chip Theory Games put a lot of love into this one. Uh, they generally do. I love Cloudspire. I really like Hoplomachus. And I really like this one as well. I just feel like they, they go a little bit further than other companies. They support the game a lot, right? They're, they're on forums, answering questions constantly. If you ever have any pieces that need to get replaced, 
I've had like one or two in Cloudspire. I've had a damaged piece in the Trove chest that I received and they are just so easy to work with. They are willing to help you out. They will send you replacement parts. They will give you tips on maybe how to prevent something from happening. Very, very good company. I can't say enough good things about Chip Theory Games. So they put a lot of love into this one and it definitely shows. This one checks a lot of boxes for me. I love dice games. I love the art and theme of this. I think it's fantastic and it's great player interaction as well as a fantastic solo game. I really like this game. I rate this game a 10 out of 10. This is one of my favorite games. And I think if you can get past some of those flaws I was mentioning, you know, with it being brutal, a lot of nuanced rules, I think if you can learn the game, get past that stuff, and you can start to appreciate what the game does really well. And it does do that stuff really well. I hope you guys have enjoyed. I want to thank you for watching. If you guys have too many bones, please let me know what you think about it. If you have any questions or comments, please put it in the section down below. So until I see you guys next time, grab some brews, play some games, and I'll see you guys later. All right, take care.